this is a war game it is used to develop military strategy the tanks roll the weapons fire the soldiers march one side wins one side loses and the generals get to watch but how do you develop nuclear strategy how did today's strategies evolve this is a computer simulation of an atom bomb used in war it is the latest tool of military planners they must use it to test new strategies fit for the nuclear age the challenge now is to develop a strategy to prevent war not win it Nuclear weapons serve only one purpose. It's an important purpose, but it's a single purpose. And that's to prevent the use of nuclear weapons against us or our friends. You can't use a gun against mosquito. Or you can't use something that will kill you against your enemy. The weapons are there, they exist. We can't will them out of uh, existence. But we can hope to manage their consequences so that uh, those consequences are peace and security and not war. The public can and must understand the, uh, those technical details about nuclear weapons and nuclear, the nuclear arms race that are relevant to set policy. You don't have to know the size of the screw that you put into the nuclear warhead, but you have to know something about what it does. You have to know something about the effects of a nuclear war. You have to know something about the impossibility of trying to control such a war. Nuclear strategy had its origin in World War II, when both sides used strategic bombing, the deliberate destruction of industrial and population centers from the air. Strategic bombing was meant to break the will of an opponent through terror and mass destruction. This was total war. Everything and everyone could become a target. Society was pitted against society. As the war raged on, a race began to make a new weapon a weapon ideally suited to the new strategy. I worked the Manhattan Project in wartime, of course, and I worked essentially out of fear. We believed the Germans were more organized, more able, and certainly more militarily directed than we, and we feared that the atomic bomb would appear first in the hands of the Third Reich, in the hands of Hitler. The Manhattan Project, the American atomic bomb program, succeeded where the Germans failed. Yet it was not until two months after the German surrender that the scientists were ready. A test was set for July 16, 1945. This device would release the force that holds together atoms. The test was called Trinity. It appeared as though the sun had risen. What I didn't, hadn't thought of was it was not only bright, it was also giving out radiant energy, heat. And my face warmed up as though I were facing the morning sun in the cold desert morning, suddenly out of darkness, then in a minute it went away again. So it was an artificial sunrise, so to speak. Word of Trinity's success reached President Truman at Potsdam. The Allies were meeting to decide the new political shape of the world. When Truman casually informed Stalin that the U.S. had a new weapon of unusual destructive force, Stalin replied that he hoped Truman would make good use of it against the Japanese. From Potsdam, the Western Allies issued a demand for Japan's unconditional surrender. A vast armada was dropping hundreds of tons of bombs on Japan, while a million men were being assembled for what was expected to be a bloody invasion. The Japanese still refused to surrender. The entire stockpile of bombs was sent to the Pacific, two bombs. Japan would be delivered a sudden shock in hopes of forcing its early surrender. On August 6th, the new weapon and the new strategy were brought together. Total war was fully realized. When I cut down with my sight, I could clearly see the city of Hiroshima. And I felt the bump of the airplane. I was greatly relieved because I knew the unit had gone from the airplane that we had successfully delivered. It meant so much to the Army Air Forces, American science and industry. Within a few millionths of a second, a few pounds of uranium were converted to energy. 
creating a fireball of 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. By the end of that day, almost 50,000 people were dead. Another 100,000 were injured, a third of whom would die in the next weeks. Here is one child who did not die. Here is the face of just one who witnessed that morning, the sun that rose from the west. It is an atomic bomb, President Truman says. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. If they do not now accept our terms, Mr. Truman said, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. On August 9th, another plane took off. A second plane, a second bomb, and a second city. Nagasaki. Ladies and gentlemen, the president has just announced full acceptance of the unconditional surrender terms by the Japanese. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. While the horn toots, the confetti flies, jubilation and excitement and joy fills the air. To the cheering crowds, the atom bomb was seen as an instrument of peace. Having found the atomic bomb, we have used it. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us instead of to our enemies. And we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes. The Americans and Russians celebrated their victory. But beneath the surface camaraderie, there was already great mistrust. Professor Michael Knox. The U.S.-Soviet relationship was always a marriage of convenience that only began when there was a common enemy, namely Nazi Germany. And once the common objective was met, all of the old differences came to the fore. There was a lot of discussion whether war with the Soviet Union would be the next phase of the Second World War. So it wasn't a matter of a sort of sharp break. Instead, it was a matter of the resurgence of old antagonisms, ideological differences, political rivalries, different economic systems, and two competing military powers. Celebrating the Allied victory under banners honoring Stalin and Roosevelt, the troops enjoyed a very short honeymoon. But the American GIs would have to be brought home soon, leaving their Soviet counterparts poised across an exhausted Europe, ready, so the Americans feared, to take it over. By October of 1945, U.S. military planners had completed this top secret study. It was a contingency plan for defeating the Soviet Union with 20 atomic bombs. But at the time, the U.S. didn't have any more bombs. In actual practice, no coherent nuclear strategy had yet been developed. The basic American approach was just to try and compete with the Russians in Eastern Europe, try not to let them take control of Eastern Europe, which in fact failed, and at the same time accumulate nuclear weapons but never really quite know when and under what conditions we would use them short of a direct attack on the United States. Out of Bikini comes the amazing camera record of history's greatest military experiment. Joint Task Force One opens the final... A year after the war, tests were begun in the Pacific to learn more about what the bomb could do. Former Ensign Bill Finnegan. We heard the countdown, 10, 9, 8, etc and the bomb went off. I think the most significant memory I have of that blast was the light and its ever-increasing intensity. It seemed uh, that it was, it was not gonna stop and I'm sure that uh, others like me thought maybe this time there'd been a mistake and this was the end of the world. The test dramatized the U.S. monopoly on atomic weapons and strengthened the impression of unequaled American power. The top secret fact was that at the time, the U.S. had only one or two usable bombs. The U.S. has the atom bomb. The Russians do not have it, at least until 1949. And yet, that's a time when the Soviets, under Stalin's leadership, do very well in terms of consolidating their control over Eastern Europe and making major territorial gains. So here, this tells you something about the limited use of nuclear weapons. The U.S. had nuclear weapons and was unable to use them in any way to prevent the Soviets 
from uh, acquiring a lot of additional territory. The Soviets, while publicly downplaying the bomb's importance, were straining to get it themselves. In Moscow, physicist Sergei Kapitza. All the necessary scientific background exists in our country. And it was a question of mobilizing our, I should say, technological resources, not only scientific ones, to solve the problem. And the main secret was now well known that the atom bomb can be built. Igor Kurchatov headed the Soviet atom bomb project. He had constructed Europe's first atom smasher in 1939. In 1943, when the Soviets began their atomic program, Kurchatov was put in charge. His success came far sooner than Americans expected, just four years after Trinity. <laughs> Professor Stephen Meyer. The detonation of the Soviet atomic bomb in 1949 didn't affect Soviet strategy at all. It gave them a weapon that they felt now they could at least match U.S. firepower. But it wasn't until Stalin died in 1953 that the Soviet military was allowed to think about atomic weapons in a revolutionary way. Before then, all the Soviet military writings, uh, which the, the military officers were talking about strategy, uh, continued to talk about the basic operating factors that developed out of World War II, the use of tank forces, the use of reserves, and excluded the atomic bomb. Although neither side had a fully formed nuclear strategy, they pressed ahead with developing a super weapon, the hydrogen bomb. Ilugalab Atoll was the site of the first American test in 1952. The device would yield a force a thousand times greater than Hiroshima. A piece of the stars brought down to Earth. With the H-bomb, even a miss of many miles would destroy a city. By 1954, both sides had it. The American nuclear weapons monopoly was broken. But the U.S. still had an important advantage, a monopoly on the means of delivering nuclear weapons. From forward bases near Soviet borders, long-range American bombers could reach almost any Soviet target. This technical and logistic superiority would make possible a new American strategy. By the early 50s, U.S.-Soviet relations had deteriorated dramatically. The coup in Czechoslovakia, the Berlin blockade, Korea and other conflicts had developed into the Cold War. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, alarmed by what he saw as Soviet advances around the world, announced the first formal nuclear strategy in early 1954. One of the lessons that some of the Eisenhower administration officials learned from the Korean War was why fight limited wars why sort of fight the communists on their own terms? Why don't we use our advantages, our assets? And they felt, and Dulles in particular felt, that our principal asset was still a major superiority in nuclear weapons. And therefore, Dulles articulated the first sort of formal, declared American nuclear strategy, which was if the Soviets or their communist allies uh, performed aggressively, even in remote parts of the world, we might, in fact, use nuclear weapons to attack the Soviet Union. And this became known as the doctrine of massive retaliation. This new jet bomber, the B-52, would help carry out the new strategy. Based in the United States, it could reach targets deep in the Soviet Union. Shorter-range bombers continued to be based in the NATO countries of Europe. By 1956, massive retaliation meant nearly 2,000 bombers carrying as many as 7,000 bombs. Testing of new weapons was begun in the Nevada desert. How ordinary homes and other structures might be affected by blast, heat, and radiation was carefully studied. Weapons technicians worked out precise calculations to determine how much damage could be expected from different kinds of bombs. Since American strategy relied on technical superiority, tests were also held to see how nuclear weapons might be used on the battlefield and how combat troops would react. This testing helped develop a wide range of nuclear weapons, from cannon shells to lightweight H-bombs. 
In the mid-50s, such battlefield tactical nuclear weapons began to be deployed with the NATO forces in Europe. The Soviets had their own priorities. In Moscow in 1955, they unveiled their first intercontinental bomber, the Bison. Now they too could deliver nuclear weapons long distances. They flew a single test squadron over the Moscow parade again and again. Shocked Western observers thought they were counting many formations. This constant movement of bombers overhead was the effort to try to convince the West that the Soviets were a major strategic power, at least equal if not better than the United States, and that there was nothing to be gained by an attack. Um, this strategy appears many times in the future in, in, Soviet, uh, in, 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 uh, in Soviet planning as well. It appears with missiles, it appears with air defense systems where they deploy phony systems that look real and so that the West believes there's actually more than, than there is there. The deception worked. U.S. intelligence estimated the Soviets were building thousands of new bombers. For the first time, Americans feared a Soviet surprise attack. On October 4, 1957, the Soviets gave America yet another shock, Sputnik. If they could send a beeping metal ball circling the Earth, they could also deliver an atomic bomb to Washington or New York. U.S. intelligence began to focus on a new potential Soviet threat, missiles. Sputnik is important because it gave Khrushchev, who was the Soviet leader at the time, the, the political power to uh, cancel the bomber programs that were in progress and shift the entire structure of Soviet military forces and military strategy towards the concept of missile nuclear warfare, marrying nuclear warheads with nuclear missiles. And that became the basis of Soviet military thinking throughout the 60s and the 70s. In response to Sputnik, the U.S. speeded up its own missile program to close what it saw as a missile gap. By the late 50s, it was able to begin basing these intermediate range missiles in Italy and Turkey, encircling the Soviet Union. Sputnik also forced a reevaluation of massive retaliation. What Sputnik did in terms of strategy was to denigrate the notion that massive retaliation was any longer credible. Because it showed, Sputnik showed that the Soviets had nuclear weapons, that the Soviets could use nuclear weapons on ballistic missiles to reach the United States territory in a very short amount of time. And therefore, it really wasn't believable that we would use nuclear weapons on Soviet territory if, for example, there was a small incursion in Southeast Asia. A massive retaliation disappeared as a realistic strategy at the time at which the Soviets developed a credible nuclear capability of their own. We therefore went to the doctrine of flexible response which says, in effect, that we will respond in a fashion which is commensurate with the aggression. In other words, we'd meet conventional attack with conventional attack. If we went on to a limited tactical nuclear war, then we would respond with tactical nuclear weapons. And in case of a strategic exchange, we'd respond that way. We proposed flexible response with a very high threshold, meaning that uh, uh, we could hardly conceive of circumstances in which uh, NATO could benefit by initiating the use of nuclear weapons. The new strategy was suddenly put to the test. In October 1962, aerial reconnaissance photographs revealed that the Soviets were secretly building missile bases in Cuba. The president called an emergency meeting of his top advisors. With missiles at its doorstep, the U.S. was threatened by nuclear weapons for the first time. On October 23rd, President Kennedy went on television. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Many people rushed to stock up on food and supplies as the two nations seemed to edge toward war. I can say without any qualification whatsoever that at no time during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, did we contemplate the, uh, the, initi the initiation of the use of nuclear weapons. Absolutely none. However, some of the alternatives that we did consider carried with them the risk that uh, there would be accidental 
or unintentional or unauthorized launch of nuclear weapons from Cuban soil by Cuban and or Soviet forces. The evidence suggests that the Cuban Missile Crisis was prompted by Khrushchev's effort to try and balance off U.S. strategic forces. Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile programs had fallen behind for, because of technical difficulties. And meanwhile, the U.S. ballistic missile program was about to take off with the deployment of a thousand Minutemen. And Kru it, the evidence is that Khrushchev then decided that one way to take up the gap in the short term was to deploy the, the medium-range ballistic missiles, which the Soviets already had, in Cuba to match the U.S. intercontinental force. Following a quarantine of Cuba and intensive negotiations, the Soviets removed their missiles. For the U.S., it was a vindication of flexible response. It's frequently said we prevailed because of uh, our nuclear superiority. That is not the case. Uh, the lesson is exactly the reverse. We prevailed because we had uh, conventional superiority in the area. After the crisis was over, a uh, Soviet uh, diplomat is reported to have said, you'll never do this again. Uh, and many people take that to mean, well, now they've decided to do something new. In fact, what the Cuban Missile Crisis did was confirm uh, the view of many of the Soviet military authorities that they had it right the first time, that Soviet military power should be based at home, based on the long-range intercontinental missiles, and that's where the program should concentrate. And the idea of deploying forces overseas uh, was a mistake. So it really reinforced those that were arguing against the Khrushchev move originally. Uh, and what you see developing after the Cuban Missile Crisis are a whole series of ICBM programs that had already been planned before the crisis and were put into operation. The Cuban Missile Crisis brought an increased public awareness of the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. Concern over radioactive fallout developed into worldwide opposition to nuclear testing. The public began questioning nuclear strategy that previously had been shrouded in secrecy and left to experts. With both sides frightened by the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Partial Test Ban Treaty was signed in 1963. The treaty restricted only above-ground testing. Its real significance, however, was in initiating the use of negotiations as an instrument of nuclear strategy. For the first time, we've been able to reach an agreement which can limit the dangers of this age. The treaty led to other agreements, such as a hotline between the two countries that would provide a communication link in times of emergency. Such confidence-building measures helped to create a new strategic understanding. By the mid-60s, the Soviets finally began deploying the intercontinental ballistic missiles the U.S. had expected almost a decade earlier. Both sides could now destroy the other from their own territory. Paul Warnke. Then it became apparent that since we no longer were alone in possession of the ability to destroy another country, that we had to rely on deterrence. Deterrence was a strategy born of necessity. Even if one of the superpowers were attacked first, some of its nuclear forces would survive. Those surviving forces would still be enough to destroy the country that attacked. Launching an attack would only bring the attacker's own destruction, so each side would be deterred from ever doing so. This strategic dilemma came to be called mutual assured destruction. An extensive U.S. buildup strengthened the deterrent effect of mutual assured destruction. Three systems were employed. The B-52. To avoid being caught on the ground if attacked, many B-52s were kept on constant alert. The fleet of 600 intercontinental bombers was completely modernized. The Polaris, a new kind of submarine that carried missiles. The missiles could be launched from underwater, and the submarine could carry as many as 16 of them. By hiding in the ocean and moving constantly, the Polaris could survive an attack and retaliate. The Minuteman, a new land-based intercontinental ballistic missile. It was made more survivable by burying it underground in concrete-hardened silos. Only a direct hit could destroy it. 1,000 were deployed throughout the Midwest. Together, the three systems came to be known as the Triad. The Soviets, however, took another path. Professor Meyer. They had uh, serious technical problems with their bomber programs all along, so that option was put aside. 
uh, missiles were deemed to be superior. Uh, they had technical problems with their missiles to the extent that the idea of a large submarine-based force was not practical at the time. Their most reliable force, and it was not very reliable, but it was their most reliable force, uh, were the ICBMs, which were land-based that they could control, that they could maintain uh, in real time in order to keep them operating. The Soviet deterrent relied mainly on their more numerous land-based ICBMs. Eventually 1,400 strong and heavily protected, enough could survive an attack to deliver a devastating reply. Mutual assured destruction isn't a theory, it's a fact. It's a fact of life or a fact of death. The fact is that if one side attacks the other with nuclear weapons, both sides will be destroyed. And you can't get away from that. The political leadership and the Soviet military leadership recognize it as a state of being. Given current technology, nuclear weapons technology and missiles, and given the nature of the social structures of the countries, the cities, the urban development, there was no way for either side to get out from underneath the problem of assured destruction. It was a de facto state of being. and it, it wasn't desirable, and it wasn't planned, but it existed. In 1972, the two sides reached an agreement that helped stabilize the relationship inherent in assured destruction. This was the culmination of the strategic arms limitation talks, known as SALT. It was a calculated attempt to use negotiation as an instrument of strategy. In the last half of the 1960s, you see the Russians building and the United States level. Uh, this, I think, more than anything else, was a stimulus for the U.S. to be interested in arms control negotiations. They were building, we weren't, we figured, why can't we negotiate to stop them from continuing to build? Arms control in Soviet strategy plays the same role as it does in American strategy. It's an effort to constrain the forces of the other side which one finds particularly threatening uh, and which for which one doesn't have a good countermeasure. Second, it's a good way to uh, try to make the arms race predictable and manageable and send it in directions that seem not to increase the insecurity of one's own country. So it is a fundamental part of security policy. SALT limited the number of weapons each side could have and established procedures for verifying them. Arms control is really a part of nuclear strategy. We want to build and negotiate. We want to have so-called stabilized forces. SALT is a means by which we begin to clarify our own definitions. What weapons are stabilizing, what weapons are destabilizing, what weapons are useful to have, what weapons are dangerous to have. It's important that, that uh, the U.S. introduce into its inventories weapons which stabilize rather than destabilize the relationship between the powers. If we were to introduce into our inventories weapons that appeared to the Soviets to be threatening uh, a first strike against their forces, with the possibility that that first strike uh, would uh, so destroy their nuclear forces as to leave them without an ability to, to respond to us, to our strike, that would be very dangerous, and it would lead them to possibly try to preempt our strike under certain circumstances, and that's what I mean by destabilizing. With SALT, Brezhnev and Nixon acknowledged the balance of terror that is at the heart of mutual assured destruction. They attempted to make that balance less precarious. But at the same time, weapons technology they had left out of the agreement threatened to change the new strategic equilibrium. Higher accuracy weapons begin to be introduced. Technology sort of marches on and does not wait for negotiations to start or to stop. There's a certain, there is a certain technological momentum. So slowly but surely, and particularly with the development of multiple warheads, MIRVs, that are, that are independently targeted, we develop the capability to strike their weapons. And they are trying hard to develop the same capability. This nose cone contains MIRVs, multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. MIRVs allow one missile to deliver as many as 14 warheads. They're also more accurate than earlier missiles. This accuracy led to another reevaluation of strategy. In mutual assured destruction, cities are targeted. Each society is held hostage by the other. This is called counter-value targeting. 
It means targeting population centers, threatening to cause as much devastation as possible. A nuclear weapon exploded anywhere in these cities will destroy them. It need not be very accurate. Accuracy, however, is essential to an alternative strategy called counter-force. Here you target your adversary's forces to destroy his ability to continue fighting. MIRVs made counter-force more attractive. One MIRV missile can destroy several opposing missiles, thereby disarming your opponent. In early January of 1974, Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger gave a speech at the Overseas Press Club in Washington. He announced a change in U.S. nuclear strategy toward counter-force. Change is one that has been discussed in various foreign policy reports of the president. Uh, what uh, the intent is, is more effective deterrence of the possibility of strategic warfare. Because it is known by all parties that the president of the United States has options other than the devastating option of going against uh, the cities on the other side. What Schlesinger then says in 1974 is, we need weapons to be able to strike with just limited capability. This in some ways is not a very new idea. It really is an extension of flexible response, but it is an extension that is incorporating the reality that we now have very advanced, very accurate weapons. We are building MIRV weapons. We have hundreds and then thousands of them. We need a rationale. Why do we need so many weapons? The answer Schlesinger provides. We need weapons to strike limited targets in a very selective fashion. And the, the sort of political and psychological argument is, unless we have that very finely tuned capability, we won't be able to deter finely tuned attacks. Soviet strategy. Uh, since the mid-60s at least, and actually going back to the late 50s, is based on preemption. The notion that if it looks like war is about to occur, the best strategy for employing one's forces are to, are to destroy the enemy forces before they can be used. That is, you target your nuclear forces first on the enemy nuclear forces, because that plays a major role in limiting damage to yourself. And then you also have forces that are set aside to target cities and industry. So it, it, it is counter-force targeting. That's exactly what preemption is. Negotiations had continued while both sides were developing a counter-force capability. President Carter and Chairman Brezhnev signed the second SALT agreement in 1979. In return for higher ceilings on some U.S. systems, the Soviets were allowed to have more large land-based missiles. American critics charged that the U.S. was negotiating itself into inferiority. SALT II became the focus of strong opposition. Prominent among the lobbying groups that opposed the treaty was the Committee on the Present Danger, made up of many former government officials. One of its founders was Eugene Roscoe. It was like the race of the tortoise and the hare. We were ahead. We were far ahead in the nuclear weapon, and then we went to sleep under a tree. The Soviet Union kept moving along, putting tremendous resources of science and technology and money into the development of nuclear weapons. And then suddenly, finally, we woke up and discovered that the tortoise had outstripped us. The critics saw the accuracy of Soviet missiles increasing. They argued that the Soviets were out to get a first strike capability that would knock out the U.S. deterrent force. By threatening to make a first strike against our ground-based missiles, our submarines in port, our planes on the ground, they think they could make the rest of our nuclear arsenal irrelevant, prevent any response, and thus uh, coerce us politically. Others argued that even if this were the Soviet intention, to actually be able to launch a first strike successfully is highly unlikely. Professor Kosta Tsipas. I think for physical reasons, because of the, of the unpredictable behavior of the missile and because of the reliability of the missile, because of the operational difficulty of orchestrating such a large attack, I think such an attack will never really succeed to the point that it would be worth it, you know, launching it. To attack a thousand silos with two thousand warheads is a, is a highly complex operation where you have warheads from different missiles attacking the same silo and you must time them right and they must all come in waves that start out of south and they move north and things like that. So uh, 
the probability that all this is going to happen exactly as planned, even though it depends on human operators that have never really practiced this, uh, is quite small. Most probably what's going to happen is going to be massive confusion. Some of the missiles will go off, some will not go off. We see what happens with NASA quite often. I mean, they want to launch a single missile and they have to stop once in a while. Now, you can't do that if you're trying to, to have a nuclear attack against another country. You just push the button and you wonder what happens. Sometimes the button will be pushed and the missile will go, and sometimes it will not. I don't think the central problem is whether the Soviet Union would actually undertake a preemptive first strike. The real problem is, I think, that the existence of a Soviet capacity to take a first strike would have a profound, and is having a profound effect, on Western political attitudes. The Carter White House, wary of losing the balance of power, gave the go-ahead for the new MX missile system. The system is survivable, it's verifiable, it has a minimum impact on the environment, it's affordable in cost, and it's consistent with our SALT goal of deep reductions in strategic arms. The MX is essentially as much a political response as a military response. He's saying we need a kind of shot in the arm, if you'll pardon the metaphor, to show that we're still competing with the Russians, that we're able to build large and effective missiles just as they are. Originally, the MX was to be hidden in an elaborate underground maze to make it more survivable. In authorizing the MX, the Carter administration moved U.S. nuclear strategy further toward counterforce. MX is sort of a premier counterforce weapon. It has large numbers of warheads, on a relatively small number of missiles, the warheads are very accurate, they can attack Soviet missile silos. Therefore, it's very much designed to be a counterforce weapon. And from the perspective of the U.S. Air Force, it's desirable because their job is, if, if war comes, to be able to destroy the enemy and to be able to destroy the enemy's forces. And they want the most capable weapons uh, they can have at their disposal. The MX provides them such a capability even though it makes other defense strategists and other politicians very nervous. It's basically a first strike weapon which threatens the Soviet deterrent and thereby provides them with very strong incentives for launching a first strike to try and destroy our MX before we get it off the ground. In other words, we're sitting in a, we'd be in a situation where both sides have a strong first punch and the guy who gets in the first punch is the guy who uh, gets off the better. President Carter authorized two other new missiles. This one, the Pershing II, is meant to have pinpoint accuracy. From Europe, it can reach targets in the Soviet Union in five minutes. The Pershing was scheduled for deployment with NATO forces because the Soviets had deployed their SS-20 missiles, aiming them at Western Europe. The cruise missile is relatively cheap to build. Twice as long and half as heavy as the Hiroshima bomb, it is ten times more powerful. It can be launched from the air, sea, or ground. It can travel hundreds of miles, guiding itself with uncanny accuracy. But because it is also so easy to hide, it is extremely difficult to verify in any arms control agreements. Now we are moving into a place where we have a new generation of weapons, Pershing missiles in Europe, cruise missiles in Europe, and the MX and other very accurate long-range missiles uh, based in the United States. Now, these new weapons, in my view, do not improve our security because they are not deterrent weapons. What they are is weapons which are only useful if you use them first. And in fact, they provide incentives for initiating a nuclear war rather than for deterring a nuclear war. The newly elected Reagan administration didn't see the new missiles as destabilizing. They were concerned about the U.S. falling behind. Our deployed nuclear forces were built before the age of microcircuits. It's not right to ask our young men and women in uniform to maintain and operate such antiques. The effectiveness of our deterrent has been eroding uh, because of the, uh, of the modernization that the Soviets have, uh, have uh, uh, put into their system and the fact that we have not. And uh, we now have systems that are uh, not too vulnerable to first strikes by the Soviets. Uh, and uh, it is essential that we rebuild them as quickly as we can.
The Pentagon's modernization program demanded the largest increase in the defense budget since the massive U.S. buildup in the mid-60s. According to newspaper reports, the buildup supported a new nuclear strategy, one in which the object is not simply to deter, but, as a Pentagon document says, to prevail. The strategy would incorporate a new generation of weapons, the MX. 100 have been authorized by Congress. The Trident submarine, carrying 24 missiles with a total of 336 warheads. For the first time, a submarine-launched missile had been designed to have the accuracy of a land-based ICBM. The B-1 bomber, canceled by the Carter administration, but then revived. The supersonic B-1 was scheduled to replace the B-52 in the American nuclear triad. The military use of space has also been given high priority. A network of satellites is necessary to maintain the command systems that coordinate U.S. nuclear forces around the world. The strategy supported by these weapons envisions controlled, limited nuclear strikes against military targets. These strikes might continue in the language of the Defense Department through a protracted period and afterward. It would be war as it had always been, only this time using nuclear weapons. Buried inside the solid rock of Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado is the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD. It directs the facilities that communicate with and control U.S. nuclear forces around the world. To be able to fight protracted nuclear war, NORAD must keep functioning even if hydrogen bombs are going off. One effect of nuclear weapons, however, especially when detonated at high altitudes, is to create a powerful surge of energy known as EMP, electromagnetic pulse. As this pulse surges through electronic equipment, transistor circuits, computers, radar, it sets up currents so strong that the equipment can burn out. In that case, the, the ability to fight a war, which means to have some kind of control over the actions of your forces, disappears. Therefore, you don't have a war, you just have you know, groups of people with missiles at their command who do not know what the leadership of the country wants and they, some of them may be very conservative and never launch, some of them may say, well, the last thing we have to do is to launch these warheads and you have a totally uh, um, chaotic situation. NORAD is trying to develop systems that won't be affected by EMP and other effects of nuclear weapons. The largest single increase in the new defense budget is for making the U.S. command, control, and communications facilities more secure. Do you need to be able to fight effectively a nuclear war in order to deter it? Or if you begin to develop that capability, does it increase the likelihood of actually fighting a nuclear war? This is sort of the conundrum that policymakers are in. Some people, many individuals in the Reagan administration, believe that the more capability you have to fight a nuclear war of all sorts, of all types, of a limited nature and so forth, the greater you strengthen the deterrent. Whereas others feel equally passionately that if you develop all those capabilities and the Russians do too, then you're marching down the path toward fighting nuclear war. We certainly don't uh, plan to fight uh, limited nuclear wars. We would, however, I think this makes good sense, like to be in a position if a nuclear uh, war should occur. We would like to be in a position to see that the minimum number of weapons are used and that the war is terminated as quickly as possible. Well, one of the difficulties about preparing to fight limited nuclear wars is that it probably makes it easier to make the decision to use nuclear weapons in the first place. You plan to use these nuclear weapons rather than to just have them there as a deterrent. This is the Arbat district of downtown Moscow, home of the Soviet Institute for the Study of the USA and Canada. The few Soviet government specialists who speak with the Western press work here. Former General Mikhail Milstein. We don't accept any concept of the, of the limited nuclear war. We strongly believe the if so-called limited war uh, starts, it immediately will escalate into uh, uh, a nuclear holocaust. For the areas where the nucle limited nuclear war will be carried on, it will be not limited. It will be a total catastrophe. 
uh, say if there is a limited nu nuclear war in Europe, for Europe it will be the end of European civilization. The Soviet strategy for nuclear, intercontinental nuclear warfare has always been the use of the entire nuclear force against the full array of targets, military targets, political targets, economic targets, and there's never been really any variance from that at all. In terms of limited nuclear war having to do with Europe, that's a very different question. Uh, there is evidence that, that Soviet military leadership does subscribe to some notion of limited regional nuclear war when it ex explicitly excludes any attacks on the homeland of the Soviet Union. Europe is considered the most likely place for nuclear war to start since so many opposing military forces are concentrated there. Also, NATO's policy is to use nuclear weapons if it's losing a conventional attack. Military exercises have been conducted to try to determine what might happen in such a case. Participating in such war games when he was deputy director of the CIA, Dr. Scoville. There would be aggression by the red team and uh, they would be using conventional forces and the blue team wasn't doing very well. So the blue team would say, well, we've got to convince these reds that uh, we're serious and we'll drop one nuclear weapon on one of their tank battalions and wipe it out and that'll scare them off and then they'll we'll ha have ended this war and that was the jumping the fire break to using nuclear weapons but the problem was that it didn't end the war and in the two cases where i fought this kind of a mock battle the end result was there was not only no europe left when we got through there wasn't any united states or soviet union as societies as we know them today Whatever we may think now, if a nuclear weapon is ever used, uh, the world will discover, however suddenly, that it has a, a, an enormous interest in constraining that use of nuclear forces. Europeans began protesting the planned deployment of American Pershing and cruise missiles and the Soviet SS-20s. Although their governments urged the deployment, the demonstrators feared that Europe would become the battleground of the two superpowers. Opposition increased in the U.S. as well. Prominent were scientists and doctors who used the fact of the devastating effects of nuclear weapons to argue for a freeze on further weapons development. Dr. Jack Geiger. There is no way of being ahead anymore. The United States and the Soviet Union are like two men standing in a basement up to their waist in gasoline. One of them's got nine matches and the other's got ten matches. And it's absurd to say that one is ahead of the other or safe. The freeze became a grassroots concern. New England town meetings began to debate the issue in early 1982. Request the President of the United States to propose to the Soviet Union a mutual freeze on the testing, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons and missiles and new aircraft designed... The freeze was meant to cut through the time-consuming process of official negotiations. The demonstrators didn't want new formulas for replacing or modifying weapons. They wanted to stop the arms race altogether and cut back. At the commencement ceremonies of his alma mater, President Reagan announced that his administration was finally opening negotiations with the Soviets. For the immediate future, I'm asking my start. And start really means we've given up on salt. Start means strategic arms reduction talks and that negotiating team to propose to their Soviet counterparts a practical phased reduction plan the focus of our efforts will be to reduce significantly the most destabilizing systems the ballistic missiles the number of warheads they carry and their overall destructive potential the start talks began in Geneva in 1982 but after a year, neither these meetings nor the negotiations over missiles based in Europe had achieved any visible progress. In Moscow, Vitaly Zhurkin. I personally don't see any positive, uh, anything positive there. I see an attempt, first of all, to uh, decrease, uh, to uh, limit and decrease only those system of strategic weapons where the Soviet Union is stronger. Uh, keeping outside of the limits of the agreements those systems like uh, SLBMs, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, sorry, like uh, cruise missiles, uh, like bombers, uh, some others, uh, in which uh, the, United States, the United States are stronger. The Soviets felt the U.S. was using the talks to get ahead. The U.S. argued the Soviets were using the talks to stay ahead. 
But even with decades of mistrust and new weapons development, negotiations remain an integral part of nuclear strategy. The record shows, in my opinion, that the Soviet Union is serious about nuclear arms control. And I think the reason that they are serious is the reason why we can trust them in this regard. You can trust anybody to act in their own self-interest. It is in the national self-interest of the Soviet Union to prevent nuclear war. They recognize they could not survive a nuclear war. I would trust them a lot more if I uh, had good information as to what they were actually doing. One thing we've learned in the arms control context in the past is that uh, the Soviets will exploit loopholes and uh, uncertainties in agreements that, uh, that have been concluded, and they will exploit them sometimes with some very unpleasant surprises. There is no need to trust them. I will not trust them. Why should anybody else trust them? But I don't have to trust them. I'm perfectly willing to sit down and negotiate with them as long as any kind of agreement we end up with is verifiable by national technical means of, of verification, namely by satellites or other means that do not have any kind of subjective kind of, of, uh, of component in it. I don't, have, I don't have to trust you if I can see what you're doing all the time. First of all, we are not lovers. <laughs> Neither the United States nor the Soviet Union. Even lovers don't trust each other, you know. Uh, well, at least they have to be a little bit suspicious. But uh, uh, speaking seriously, well, it comes, first of all, through talks, through negotiations, through verification. It comes through coming to an agreement, a real agreement, which based on two principles, which were accepted by uh, four American administration, parity and equal security. And if this, all these things are fulfilled, I mean, uh, uh, going to life, then the trust will come somehow. The general thrust of administration policy has been to propose to the Soviets reductions in forces, strategic forces and theater nuclear forces, that would have the effect of reducing the threat that we perceive emanating from the Soviet Union and would perhaps, uh, one doesn't really know quite what they think, reduce the threat that they may perceive coming from the United States. And that situation is a, is a much more stable one than the one we have now. Today, both sides face each other with huge arsenals and with strategies and weapons that may make war and accident more likely. But in April 1947, the United States had zero ready atomic weapons. And now we have some 25, 30,000. The Russians have some 15, 25,000, adding up maybe to 50,000 total or more. This extraordinary increase, 50,000, each one Hiroshima-like, so to speak, many of them much larger, only a few smaller is a, a new phenomenon in our day. We don't really know how to understand it. That's the trouble. The diplomats and the military have felt, well, it's always easier to get more than fewer. It's always safer and surer and stronger appearing. Let's get more. That was the way it was in the past. They've not understood that this is now a great danger, a mutual danger in which both superpowers live. They are each able to destroy the other and themselves by initiating this effect. And I think there's no security in the long run except reducing the number very, very sharply. If we are making errors, they are on the side of caution. And we are saying, let us make sure we have that little extra rather than not have enough. The, the I irony of this, of course, is that if the Russians, in fact, feel the same way, it propels a tremendous amount of momentum to our competition. And we just keep each saying to each other, we better be safe than sorry. And we keep building. And maybe one day we'll make a mistake with catastrophic consequences. If the goal of strategy is to ensure the security of a nation, a successful strategy in the nuclear age remains elusive and uncertain. But there is no uncertainty about the effect of the weapons both sides have. If the strategy of deterrence fails, it could release the most destructive arsenals ever assembled. In World War II, the total destructive force expended by all the warring nations amounted to roughly three megatons. A megaton is the destructive force equal to a million tons of TNT. From 1939 to 1945, about three million tons of TNT were exploded. Three megatons. Today's nuclear arsenal is equal to almost 15,000 megatons, nearly 5,000 World War II's. <laughs> 
ready to be unleashed at a moment's notice. If this arsenal were made up of only Hiroshima-sized bombs, and if one bomb were dropped every three seconds, every three seconds another Hiroshima, the nuclear rain would fall for 40 days and 40 nights without end. 